Hey, everybody, it's Key Issue, the definitive podcast. Today's hand gestures are wiggling fingers for me. Isaac Elliott Fisher, my co-host. Jazz hands. Oh, that's nice. Right? What would blues hands be? There has to be... Like saxophone? We, um, we're in issue... Uh, I said it, I, conf- I conflated it's issue. What, you know what? We're going to go with it. Why don't we just go with it, Rand? Why don't we just commit to the fact that we don't have episodes here? We have issues. issues. We have issues. Oh, that's probably already a show. This here we are. We're in uh, issue ten, and today we're not talking about a superhero exactly. We're talking about a Canadian superhero that has a different role. If this person was going to be a superhero, they may call this person the tastemaker. The Canadian taste. Well, I think it's actually gone further than that. Um, If you, like me, were from a small town and you ventured into Toronto to get comics in a certain time in the 80s, you might have bumped into this man and he might have introduced you to something like, oh... Alan Moore, he might have introduced you to Swamp Thing. He might have introduced you to Eastman and Laird, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He might have introduced you to Neil Gaiman. He might have introduced you to some of the finest comics you ever read. Or he might have physically introduced you to someone like Ken Stacy, who is a great Canadian comic artist. Personally, he is Mark Asquith. Mark Asquith, I sense you here. Hi, how are you? Now, we're going to talk to you about yourself for a while, and you're normally accustomed to talking about everybody else, and we probably do that with you at some point too, if not later today. But We have, in fact. It is that. time to talk about you, not just because of what you've done on both sides of the camera, but because you have become a person who has shared your interests so widely that you've actually had more than a small ripple effect in the industry just with fans alone, haven't you, over the years? Yeah, I never really think about that, but I've been a 31-year career in television and and film, and I guess when you do that, your (laughs) ideas get out there. Uh, I think one of the oddest things is that working at the Silver Snail from 82 to 87, it was my soapbox was a store, but then when I started working at TVO and created Prisoners of Gravity, my soapbox became... Uh, television and then later went to space and that was a national uh, Canadian national Mm -hmm. television channel so my soapboxes just keep getting bigger and bigger (laughs) so the soapbox that you're on or the platform that you're on to me was always um it was always the same subject matter in different ways so it didn't matter if it was you talking to you as a person talking to you in the store listening to you do an interview with someone like Jack Kirby or watching you, you know, interview the cast of a series that I was interested in, you always contained some kind of integrity or some kind of consistency across. And I think to to look at why that is, why your taste making and your sense of maybe self, you have to go all the way back. I'm not going to Wikipedia. I'm not going to go that way. But I know you've told me in the past that you were a lifetime pop culture, book, and comic person. So why don't you take us back to Chile, Ottawa? How did you discover the pop culture that you're so part of now? I think part of it was, uh, it's a weird thing to say, but part of it was a combination of abundance and uh, austerity. So the abundance was books in my family. My mother ran a bookshop in Ottawa called The Bookery. My family was always interested in comics. Uh, I got Tantam and Asterix and Obelix when I was four and uh, loved them. And the austerity part was uh, no TV. So Mm. when you don't have a television television becomes really important to you Mm -hmm. and uh but comics i the the thread in comics is interesting for me because i was looking back at it because i liked uh tantan and asterix but then um i was you know i read them all and uh at about the age of seven i discovered a, a stack of comics about 40 or 50 comics and uh, I was just obsessed by them. They were up at my cottage. They'd been left there by a couple of boys who were older than me. And the next year I went back to read them and I went, these are terrible. <laughs> like these aren't even close to the comics that I like. 
And then I didn't read comics again until, I don't know, maybe, you know, until I was 18 or 19 and, you know, off to university. And um, in 1976, The Silver Snail opened, and that just changed everything for me. I, I went in and I just could not believe there were so many comics that were available to me because in those days, particularly in Ottawa, you would go to the 7-Eleven or the corner store. Mm -hmm. There were no bookstores or used bookstores that really specialized in back issue comics. So that became a big thing for me. And the other thing at, at university, I, I had a fantastic education. And one of the people who edu who is my teacher was uh, Marshall McLuhan. Another one was Northrop Fry. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I know it just sounds like bizarre name dropping. It is. In name dropping and that was you know that was really fun and then when I left university I started working at Coach House and one of the key people at Coach House was BP Nickel who was really into comics and I had met him because my previous job in high school was working for Oberon Press which is another book publishing company and I I met him I guess it would have been 1968 so I would have been 12 years old and I met BP Nickel, and I, he just was the coolest guy I had ever met in my entire life. And then when I got to Coach House, he and I became friends. And relatively quickly, after about a year at Coach House, he said, do you want to be the 50th best designer in the world, or do you want to be the best at something in the world? And uh, I thought about it, and I said, well, I want to be the best. You know, and he said, well, it's comics. Like, I've never met anybody who cares about comics the way that you do. And I'm looking at BP going, wow, but you care about comics as much as I do. And he'd written Fraggle Rock. He'd done, you know, poetry. He was just a legend to me. And, um, but he kept saying, you know, I know this much, Mark, and you know this much. And I, I kept thinking, well, that, that can't be right. But I was trying to, you know, read everything and get caught up. And then in 19, uh, 82 I came back I, I decided to leave Coach House I decided to leave Toronto and I did one of those classic Ozzy Mendias trips through Europe with no money and I uh, came back and I anyway it's a weird thing but in 1980 I met Frank Miller Frank Miller said you should go to Greece I thought that would be a really cool thing I would be sending him postcards he would be telling me what I should do it was the whole thing was pretty weird and i got back to toronto and i decided i was going to write comics but uh fate intervened and the silver snail guys said why don't you come and join us while you're writing this won't be more than 40 hours a week it's going to be fine and you know you can write which was a lie <laughs> so i'm i mean this is one of these things for people who have never talked to you you have to have a basket to hold all the questions that you want to ask. So for people, again, who don't know, this is the kind of thing where you would say, blah, blah, blah. And then Frank Miller told me to blah, blah, blah. Wait a minute. And, and the first time I had a stack of comics, it was 1963. 62, 63, maybe two of the best years in comics. And they were crap. What and, was in there? <laughs> what were you reading? <laughs> That's my first well, question. Well, what's interesting is that I later did... I, the books that I had were not good. And so they were, uh, I mean, my favorite of the batch were all the Eclipso comics. And wow. but mostly what the, they had was, you know, Lois Lane and oh, Jimmy Olsen. Yes. And there was one Batman comic that took me about 10 years to figure out which one it was, uh, courtesy of Ty Templeton, who, who I said, I, there's a Batman comic with hobo signs. And Ty went, oh, it's this one. And I... I can't even remember what it is now. But I then, you know, years later, when I looked at the dates and I was remembering the comics, I thought, you know, this is interesting because I think the two boys who left the comics took all the good ones. So they they took uh, Spider-Man, they took the Fantastic mm -hmm. Four, uh, which, as you say, 60, these comics would have been late 62, the summer of 62. Incredible. And I read them in the summer of 63. But what I remember were the ads, what I remember were, you know, the really kind of vivid imagery. And I remembered that I hated an artist passionately. He was the only artist I didn't like. 
And it was Alex Toth, <laughs> who later became my, one of my favorite artists. Wow. But when you were a kid, my mom always used to say, kids have no taste. And that's, I mean, I, it was the sparkly stuff that yeah. I was attracted to then. But even then, they weren't well written. They didn't engage me. The only comic that I thought was at all interesting was Eclipso, which was, as it turns out, the one that was drawn by Alex Toth. And those were the images that stayed in my head. You know, And the Batman comic was not a good Batman comic. I, I don't want to bag on Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane, but I, there is something stiff. And that I, who were those for? Like, I had the same experience as you. Let me back up real quick. Isaac and I are from a small town. We're 40 years in, different in age, but we couldn't agree more. Think about that idea, Isaac, of, We've hit it in every every version of this show we've done that not having stuff builds the need, builds the drive. First of all, it's only twenty years, but the uh, yeah, the it's true. I actually am con concerned about that with my own children now. To go, you can have everything mm -hmm. all the time ever. So I have to like build in ritualized, you know, e experiences for them that make them want something. Because if you don't want anything, you don't want for anything, then what's the point? You're not gonna try to achieve anything. So yeah, pop culture, I was exactly as you say, Rand, we've talked about this before. We we only had so many options at the corner store at Becker's down the street. And uh, you know, when you're getting your popsicle and you try to find some comic books, you know, you're lucky if you find anything. So when you discover those little those little gems, man, you really you'd sink your teeth into them, man. The other thing I I didn't know it at the time, but I, I liked comics and I like comics as a medium and the comics that I, I mean, these things can be random, right? You don't run across the right, right ones, but I discovered head shops and I discovered a comic called The Man by Von Bode, which was the first comic to make me cry. I discovered, you know, Cheech Wizard. I discovered yeah. Zap comics mm -hmm. and they were vital. They mm -hmm. had such energy and power where the mainstream Marvel and DC comics that I was seeing didn't have. And uh, unfortunately, the period that I come in or the comics that I saw were not the ones with juice. Um, but in 1974, um, a great friend of mine who had, I, has what I call the tiny perfect collection one day said to me, you know, you need to come over and we'll just, sit, you know, he was going to read and just said, come over and sit on the couch and read. And, he, and I said, what's your favorite, you know, what's your favorite comics? And he goes, oh, well, try the Avengers. And I started reading the Avengers yeah. run and he told me, oh, start around here. Uh, I think it was around issue 50. And it was John Buscema art and mm -hmm. inked by George Klein. And I read Behold the Vision. And it was one of those revelations like this is the greatest comic I've ever read in my life. And I and I was hooked on the Avengers. And Peter was very smart. And he goes, well, I don't know that you love the Avengers, but you sure love John Buscema. Yeah. So now you should read The Silver Surfer. And so I would read The Silver Surfer. And I there were certain things that I liked. And then uh, I didn't like the end of The Silver Surfer, the last few issues. They were by some guy called Jack Kirby. <laughs> and he said, OK, well, now I need to educate you about Jack Kirby. <laughs> and so we did that. And then, you know, yeah. uh, and then I kind of fell in love. He thought this was funny, but I kind of I have no. It doesn't matter to me if it's a love comic or a horror comic or a superhero comic. I am not a genre guy. I'm just a guy who reads comics. Yeah. And and it's because of that, I fell in love with the four brilliant artists from the studio. Right. Of course, Jeff Jones, uh, Barry Windsor Smith, uh, some guy called Bernie Wrightson and Mike Kaluta. Yeah. And those four guys, they were they were huge for me, but they were hard to get. And the mm -hmm. only comics that I really saw were in Peter's collection. So when I came to Toronto, I went to Captain George's Memory Lane. Uh, you know, of course, if you went to the Beckers, you weren't going to find mm -hmm. Bernie Wrightson or any of those guys because the, that work had come and gone. And so when I finally did go to the Silver Snail in 1976, the attitude there was, well, all the good stuff's already happened. You know, there's no more, you know, good wow. stuff. Stuff is no longer happening. And I was going to Becker's and I was going to the corner stores and I had found a comic that I thought was unbelievably great, which was Howard the Duck. And there were always some little comic here and there that I would like. 
um, you know, Man Wolf by George Perez mm -hmm. go, or Logan's Run again by George Perez. And then you start realizing, you know what? It's the certain writers and artists that I like. But that took that took a while to figure out. Man, it took it took everybody. Or I speak for myself. It took me forever. I, I literally probably not until I was able to go to the snail to realize the things that I liked were, you know, structured around the creator and everything just seems sort of when you're a child, like you say, you like things and you don't really know why. And you need that. You said you had that friend who said in 74, here's what I like and here's why you like it. And if you don't have that, if you don't have someone pointing you, you end up just with this mess of comics and you can't figure out why is this bad? Why is this good? What is the attraction? It's so difficult to connect those dots without that contact or tastemaker, if you will, a tastemaker in your mm -hmm. in your scenario. And I mean, I don't even know. I mean, I suppose people who are more adept at using the internet than I am would probably be able to utilize its power to that end. But nowadays, but I actually kind of wonder. There's almost too much to go. Well, how how do I connect the dots? You know, is it this guy or is it this thing? There's almost too much to information. So maybe having that focus thing, that was really, a, you know, really lucky for you to uh, have. I'll jump in and say, I think too, you're just older enough than me to have maybe been the right age to get what were considered some alt comics in those early 70s. Head shops. I love and it. blowing your mind open yeah, enough no. to be able to get your taste more defined. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it, it is a fair statement. I, I, but I'd always been interested in ephemeral culture and and uh, and underground kind of stuff. Even well, you know because the way that I grew up, it was music, mm. and uh, my dad and mom were really into music. And my dad kind of would find these radio stations from Detroit that would play, you know, Motown, and he was really big on Motown. And then my cousins, who were slightly older than me and totally not into comics, they were into the British Invasion, so they turn me on to little known mm -hmm. groups like, you know, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, but their absolute favorite was the Kinks. And I became, of course, a massive Kinks fan. But mm -hmm. again, just to go back, I, I think you're totally right. I think this whole idea of curation of somebody who's knowledgeable leading you. Mm -hmm. And that was something when I went to the Silver Snail in uh, 1982, I thought, I have to be the guy. And so I have to read every single comic book that comes into the store, every single new comic I would read. And then I, after about maybe a year, I thought, you know what, I should try to read every single comic in the store. And uh, I know that just sounds strange, but I was an avid reader. I had time and I loved comics and I had the greatest library in the world. I mean, you're yeah. you talk about abundance. The Silver Snail was Mecca. I mean, it was crazy. And, a, a, you know, somebody's collection would come in. There'd be 10,000 comics and I would go through them and I would I, my, I would be, oh, my God, I had never seen a copy of Our Love Number 5, the rare Jim Steranko comic. And I'd buy it and then I would never see another one. Yeah. Fever Dreams by Richard Corbin. I've, I've seen one copy and, it, and and I was in the middle of. The, the rainforest of comics. It's true. You think I would have seen every single comic. But, you know, I was there for five years and there were tons of things that were rare and hard to find. And in Canada, Conan 3 was hard to find. Silver Surfer 4 was hard to find. So if you were collecting, it was a very strange thing because Overstreet would come out and they would say, you know, number one is worth this much, number two, then number three. And if you were living in Goderich or living in Smith Falls, you're like, well, they're all hard to find. Yes. So, you know, maybe, you know, I found, you know, Conan one and two with no trouble. I found a six and a seven, but it took me years to find a three. But, you know, it was never, you know, um, priced that way. Uh, rarity in that way no. it was regional. And this is the other thing about the Internet is that it's changed that idea. Things that were incredibly rare. Now eBay is, or uh, sites like it, are an attic. There's somebody's attic. You can find anything. You mentioned it's something else early. You mentioned Tintin and Asterix. And for people in the United States, they won't understand how much British and European material was able to make an imprint with Canadians. 
And I, I like that you opened with Tintin, which was in our school libraries. It was something that was meaningful, but I don't know if it was the same in America. What do you think about that? That's an excellent question. I, uh, my next door neighbors were British and they had Eagle mm -hmm. magazine and that was a really big deal. And, uh, and then later Doctor Who magazine. And um, because in Ottawa, you could, there were magazine stores that were international um, you could get stuff. And, and if you weren't intimidated by the fact that it was another language, um, then you would be all right. So Metal Orlan came out and I, that exactly. just, I, it was unbelievable. Like, this is not con like, I don't know what this is, but this is not what I am used to. And I just fell in love with the work of Philippe Durier and, uh, some guy called Jean Giraud or yeah. Gier or Mobius, his, his name seemed to change all the time. Yeah. Were, were you, I guess this is probably a good a time as any to ask about this. So to back into some of you getting to the other side and meeting these people, I, I don't understand that you met Frank Miller prior to being at the snail. I just assumed that the snail was sort of the, the Mecca for meeting the creators as well. But before you tell that Frank Miller link, for people who don't understand how important the silver snail has been in not just in Toronto, but to many young titles, like you were in our turtle documentary, uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in some way owes the silver snail uh, a thank you. And many titles and many creators do, don't they? Yeah, it, because I always thought that the silver snail was like a bar, you know, it was like watching Cheers on TV and, you know, a customer would come in and everybody would say, Bruce, or, you know, Randall. Um, but the, I, because of my idea that I had to be a curator, I, one of my jobs, I thought, well, A, was to read everything, and B, always sort of know what was going on. But I realized very quickly there was a fantastic, really interesting artistic scene happening in Toronto. Artists like Ken Stacy, mm -hmm. Dean Motter. Uh, Paul Ravash, Ty Templeton. And one of the things that when I, I, after being there for a while, I realized, hey, you know what, I could, I, I would really like Ty Templeton to meet Kyle Baker, and I can actually make that happen, which is kind of a weird thing. So my, my, um, I don't know, it's just, yeah, if I'm running a bar, I want the people at the bar to be comfortable and to meet other really cool people. Or, or it's like throwing a party and you want to introduce people. You're like, okay, Randall, I really want you to meet, you know, my friend Frank or my friend Ty or my friend Dean. And the, out of that, my hope was that we would build a community because it felt very fragile at the time. And, uh, you know, an artist that I adored called John Allison would just disappear from the Toronto scene. Uh, you know, I love uh, Ken Stacy, but when he left Toronto, I thought, well, the energy in Toronto is going to drop about mm -hmm. 30 points because he's a big personality. Um, but yeah, it, my, I, I began to think, well, that was the other thing because I'd met these people, uh, like say Frank Miller or, you know, whomever they, they would be very interested in the silver snail and, and they were, they would want to see this thing that, that was up in Toronto. And of course, we carried all kinds of European stuff so that I'd have somebody like Mike Zek come up to the store Jeez. and he'd say to me, well, uh, can you give me a discount? I'm like, every guest gets 20% off. And I thought, what's this guy going to you know, buy? And it was all European stuff. Yeah. It was all European. It was Druyer, Mobius, um, you know, all this stuff. And uh, that seeing sort of being behind the curtain and seeing what these guys were into was just as fascinating to me as any other part of the job. And then you'd meet someone like Bill Sinkavich and all you'd do mm -hmm. for an hour was talk about Dune. Like, you know, like it's a, it becomes a thing where we hardly would, in some cases, we would hardly talk about comics, but we were talking about the grist of the cultural mill that was creating comics. Totally. And that's, that's something that... <sighs> Now there's a Comic-Con, it seems like, everywhere. Like, Comic-Con has penetrated common culture, but it's also the, the language of Comic-Con or the idea of a Comic-Con or a show. It's in the internet. It's baked into the news. It's baked into the entertainment uh, media. But back then, 
You're right. That community structure was so difficult to get a handle on. Would you say there was sort of a ground zero for that in Toronto, even across more than just in Canada? Like the fact that you had so many of those original turtles, the fact that you met Frank Miller in 1980, like was he even Frank Miller yet in 1980? He was just Frank Miller, wasn't he? Yeah. I. So that story is uh, there was a convention. I had been to a couple of the one day conventions in Toronto and they would have up Walt Simonson and I just basically got something signed. And then the big deal one for me was Jim Steranko, who came and, you know, would only sign three comics per pe- person. And there was a huge giant line. And I brought my R Love number five. And he said, I'll give you I'll trade you a uh, drawing for our love number five. And I said, no, thank you. I'm keeping my comic. And the only thing that saved that story is that I never saw another one. I mean, it's been reprinted, but I do now think, man, I would love to have a Starank mm-hmm. original. That would be really fun. But um, in 1980, in the fall of 1980, uh, there was a big convention in Ottawa and my family were there. And it was a kind of a good time for me socially. I thought I can't be in Toronto. I want to be in Ottawa. And I went to MapleCon 3. And uh, Dave Sim, who I had met, uh, was there. I was working at Coach House. I'd just come out of university. And I met um, a bunch of creators. Uh, The strangest one was Jim Shooter, who I said, I want to break into comics as a writer. And he tried to talk me out of it, which Mm -hmm. was really fascinating. And then I met this guy, and uh, I met three people who kind of changed my life in terms of comics. Uh, Sven Patrick Larson, who was, I don't know, 14 and really into comics and and really open and kind of was me when I was that age. And a letter writer called Elizabeth Holden from Ottawa, who was famous. She had letters in the X-Men and Daredevil and all these comics. Mm. And she had exquisite taste, and I had... I don't know why, but my life works in strange ways. I was being interviewed by the CBC. I just walked in, you know, to the Chateau Laurier and they said, hey, can we ask you about comics? I'm like, why would they pick me? Well, okay, why not? So they started asking me questions and I kept kind of dodging what they wanted me to say. And instead I would say things like, well, comics are a medium and not a genre. And, you know, they kept wanting to talk about you know, cosplay and superheroes. And I kept saying, comics are way more than that, which must have really frustrated Mm -hmm. the producer. But a crowd of people kind of gathered there, and one of them was Finn, and one of them was Elizabeth. And they said, okay, well, what's your favorite comic? And at the moment, at that time, it was Master of Kung Fu, which completely threw Mm -hmm. them off. Kung Fu comic is like your favorite comic. And afterwards, she came up to me and said, that's my favorite comic, too. And uh, that, that was one of those bonding things that kind of happened at that time. And then there was this young guy there, and I had a girlfriend who was a waitress, and he, his girlfriend at the time was there. And so I said, well, let's go to dinner. And so we just went, and he just finished. The comic that had come out like a week or two before was uh, Daredevil, uh, the first one that he wrote. Come on. One. And and he had the original art there, but he wouldn't sell it to me. And we just talked. We just talked. And we didn't really talk about comics. We mostly talked about Hill Street Blues, um, Bruce Springsteen, and living in Vermont. And uh, and, wow. and, and he, I, it was just one of those weird things. And we really, really connected. I With all three of those people that I mentioned, there was a really deep commitment to those people and we started to correspond i mean not not as a group not like an app mm-hmm. but just me and frank me and elizabeth me and sven um and then when i leave the silver snail sven comes in and replaces yeah. me elizabeth and i are are still friends and uh you know my relationship with frank kind of really was great because i had a ringside seat from 1980 to you know i mean for at least a decade maybe more there's a, a Zelig element to it, but it's more than that. Yeah. Isn't there something there to be said that you, I, I think, so I, I'll kind of back up to how I would engage with you at that time. I'm just a, a kid going into a shop and it might be 84, maybe as my first year being in Toronto and going into the shop, you might say, 
a title to me that I didn't, I had no idea about. You might attune me to a writer. But the interesting part was if you knew the writer or the artist, or if you had something personal about it, it really made it into more than just a transactional structure. Like it kind of humanized the industry or humanized collecting and humanized the titles. And I think maybe it worked the other way around that someone like Frank Miller or Kevin Eastman needed you to be there or people like you, right? To, to point the finger and help them out as well. Maybe that's part of how it wasn't like Zelig. It's like something else that they, maybe they needed you as well. Is that fair? I don't know. I, I, but what I do know is my transactions with people in the store. The first thing was to listen or to see. So, you know, a regular customer would come in and they would always be buying Batman or Superman and, uh, I mean, one of my favorite stories is oh, I was talking to somebody and I realized their favorite artist was uh, Michael Golden. And so we were talking and I said, so, you know, what do you think of the DC work? And they went, he's never done any work for DC. And I thought, there it is. There is there is my entry. And so he came in the next week because he was a regular customer. He came in every week and I'd set aside a bag of comics about this high. And I said, these are the comics that you don't know about that Michael Golden drew. And he bought every single one. They were all cover price. I mean, they didn't mark them up um, because wow. at that time, I, I mean, Michael Golden wasn't going to be the, marked up that much anyway. And the expensive ones he already had, like the Nam, but he didn't have like the Batman comics and, you know, the, the cask of Ant, Amontilla, da, Amont, well, you know the one I mean. Amontillado. Montadio. Montadio. Anyway, it's it was the, just listening and seeing what people were doing, and if they were really really into writing, then you'd say read Alan Moore or mm -hmm. read Archie Goodwin. If they were from OCA and they were interested in experimental art, then that would be Bill Sienkiewicz. And and to be honest, I was more about the creators, mm -hmm. but you had to kind of figure out what creators that person would like, given the taste that they brought into the store or that they were normally buying. It, it, but that idea that you helped them to be people to sort of a buying public, it changed comics from being monolith, you know? that, And that's well, kind of what they were to some of us. Well, if there's a thread to my career, I think it's that I want to tell people that human beings made this. Mm-hmm. And that's a very simple thing. I wanted people to know that Jack Kirby and and Stan Lee created the Fantastic Four. And this was, a you know, that to me, those people as people were very, very important to me. And I think because I had no agenda and I didn't think I would be lasting that long in comic. I mean, at one level, I thought, well, I'll be working at the Silver Snail forever. But uh, I and I'm going to write anyway, but there was no real, like, you know, Frank introduced me to your editor kind of thing. It was just, we were friends. Mm -hmm. That was a separate thing from, you know, our kind of transaction, if you will. So yeah, it's hard. It's a difficult thing, but I really felt that it would, I wanted particularly the people that were coming into the store that were so creative and so interesting I wanted them. Oh, what happened? Password? No, I'm going to cancel. Um, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted the people that were really wonderful and creative to meet other wonderful and creative mm -hmm. people. So it's interesting and, and too. Coach House was Coach House. You go into Coach House, and there would be Margaret Atwood or Michael Ondaatje or BP Nickel or Crad Kolodny, and all this sounds like name dropping now. I mean, I was joking with somebody once, and I said. When I met Frank Miller, he wasn't Frank Miller. Yeah, when exactly. I met Neil Gaiman, he was writing for Knave magazine. He wasn't Neil Gaiman. Um, I mean, he kind of was to me because I had read a Xerox of uh, violent cases. But when you become known as the guy who's really passionate mm -hmm. and is very much about the creators, then people send you Xeroxes and sketches and, you know, all kinds of stuff because they're hoping that you will then promote them, promote in a kind of you know, whatever small P uh, way. Um, but then as my soapbox became bigger um, in media and television, yeah. and the documentaries, 
then that changed everything. But I didn't change. My attitude was still the same. Human beings made this. And this is, you know, something that I think is great. And people used to say, you know, I mean, I turned down an interview with, with, with Jack Kirby because I didn't think that he should be interviewed when he was that old and he was not frail. And I did not want to um, show uh, that Jack Kirby. And, uh, and I, I, it was Frank Miller who said, you owe it to comics. You owe it to Jack. You have to do it. And he, you know, in retrospect, he was 100 percent correct. So I'm going to make a little transition here. And again, for people that don't realize, it wasn't just a crazy bar at the Silver Snail. Do you remember across the road was John Rose and Baca Books? Yeah. And that there was another. In that area. I mean, yeah. Baca, I went to Baca. I used to kind of lie and said that I went to Baca once a week. And I don't think that's really true. I think I went every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love science fiction. And, I, and there seemed to be something going on. Uh, in that store, and there seemed to be a lot of stuff happening in science fiction that wasn't happening in comics. Comics, you know, really needed, you know, I mean, there were maybe five guys who I thought were really doing the job in terms of writing, and in, this would have been 1982, 1983, and I, mean, I would read on the magazine, and mm -hmm. I, but I mostly just said to the people at the at BACA, tell me what to read. Yeah. And they were my curators. They were they were the people that opened that up for me. Well, imagine for me that stretch of Queen Street. I mean, I met Bob Dylan at the Silver Snail. I bumped into David Bowie around there. I talked to Bruce Sterling and William Gibson, and just it was just like the energy around that was crazy. And and here's my transition point. And then somehow you took all that and put it on TV on <laughs> little TVO. That's the craziest part. How did that happen? Well, in 1986, uh, Daniel Richler decided he wanted to do um, a 25-minute segment on comics on The National. And that was because he heard me on Peter Zosky. And he, he came into the store and I said, oh, man, I've been a fan of yours since you were on Show Radio. And he did one of those, like, <laughs> really? You go that far back? And I'm like, I'm from Ottawa, you know, whatever. And... Um, but he was a big shot. You know, he was mm -hmm. the national arts correspondent for the CBC. And I'm just this guy, you know, within a comic book store. But he came in and he said, I'm thinking of, it was the same thing that happened with Ron Mann and Comic Book mm -hmm. Confidential. Ron mm -hmm. came in and said, I want to make a, 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 a Valentine to, to um, Marvel Comics. And I said, no, you don't. I've seen your work. I used to work at Coach House. You made a documentary about Coach House. You're friends with you know, Bukowski, I mean, you've got to do the underground comics. In fact, you need to do the creators that are really pushing comics as a medium. And then he went, okay. And then Daniel Richard was kind of the same thing. I said, wow. look here, let me give you six comics. And, um, and I gave him uh, the first issue of Dark Knight, the first issue of Watchmen, uh, Love and Rockets, uh, Mouse, which was out mm -hmm. as, a, as a, a thing. It was a graphic novel. And I just waited for him to come back into the store, which I knew he would. And, and he came in and he went, this is amazing. And um, can I interview you? And I said, yes. And so he interviewed me. And, um, and then I said, you know, you seem to be really interested in Frank Miller and the Canadians like John Byrne and you know, certain people that you were asking me about. But mostly it was Miller and Art Spiegelman. And I said, okay, here's, here's how to get in touch with Art. He was, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is phone number. Here's how to get in touch with Frank Miller. And so he went out and got those people. I mean, wow. I couldn't go, you know, to, I didn't have a, you know, I was just a guy working in a store, but I had the Rolodex. And then he came back and he said, you know, if you want to help me, I'm going into the edit bay and uh, maybe you can help me. So I realized something um, in 1986, because Comic Book Confidential hadn't come out yet. But I, re I said to Daniel, one of the things that always pisses me off when I watch comics being covered on TV is they'll go, Jack Kirby invented the Fantastic Four, and they show you a John Buscema <laughs> Fantastic Four. Which they did it all the time yes. because you, they didn't have any sense of what it was. 
And I said, you can't do that. You, you absolutely can't because the people who know, even if they don't know, they should know. But if you're talking about Picasso and you pick up, put up a Monet, people are going to think you're a joke. So you can't do that. You have to pick the right mm -hmm. image. So if, if Frank Miller is talking about Dark Knight, that's a specific thing. If he's talking about Batman, that's a slightly different thing. And if he's talking about Batman Year One, that's a different thing. And so you, I kind of educated him and the edit bay. I, there was a great editor, and I would say, you need to put this image in. And I had the comics there, and I would just say, you need this one, you need this one. And at the end of it, Daniel said, you know, you're a born producer. You should create and produce a TV show. I said, well, I've pitched it to Moses Neimer, and he says no. And, uh, you know, I've tried, but I, you know, I, I'm a guy who works in a store, you know, <laughs> like, so I don't really think that's going to happen. And he said, well, if I'm ever in the position to uh, make it happen, I will. And he became the creative head of arts at TVO. Mm -hmm. He called me up and he said, look, I'm, I'm, I've got to create two television shows. I want you to create one of them and I'm going to create the other one. And uh, his show was going to be a book show and he didn't have a name for it. And, uh, and I, that was really exciting. And that became imprint. And I kind of worked beside them and we shared some guests and that was really fun. And then um, I got to create my show, which, again, I had trouble finding a name for that. But uh, eventually it became Prisoners of Gravity and Imprint went for 20 years and Prisoners of Gravity was five years and 137 episodes. Which are hard to find unless you want to watch them on YouTube, but everybody should. That's a repackage that needs to happen, don't you think? Just to quickly well, summarize what it is as well, if you would, like how it played sure. out. Well, Prisoners of Gravity was a half hour TV show. And originally I, it was going to be a six minute insert between two episodes of Doctor Who. But they lost the rights to Doctor Who, but Daniel still liked the idea. And I said, well, if I'm going to do the interviews and write it and kind of mm -hmm. do it, then I can't host it. And besides, I've got, I've got a, I'm blessed with a face for radio. So I'm not going to be the guy who's going to do that. You need a real host. Like, I, I mean, I knew enough about TV to know you needed somebody who could sell it. And I felt I'm not a salesman. Like, I, I don't know how to do that. Not realizing, of course, that that's what I was doing every day at the Silver mm -hmm. Stage. Mm -hmm. But I had no insight into that. And, um, but I, uh, we got Rick Green, who I played ball hockey with anyway, which Americans think is such a funny thing that, you know, so you would know him anyway. But it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, well, I knew him when he was, the Frantics were a three-piece and they were, a, a, you know, Ryerson. But that's how Canada works, right? If you were into something, then you would be into it. And yeah. he knew me from the Silver Snail because he and the Frantics would come in. And, and we played ball hockey together. So there you go. But... Um, I've lost the thread of your question. I, I will fill it in. You had a context for the show, and then you had dropped these interviews into the context. And it was light and goofy and funny. But then the interviews were like with people you couldn't imagine that you would get. Well, one of the things that, that I, first of all, I'm a firm believer because I came from Coach House and Oberon, that when you have no assets, when you have no money, for example, what do you have? And without ego, I thought, well, they have my Rolodex, they have me, they have a really great host in Rick Green, So, and we, but we have no money. So the only way that I can get these people is if I go to one convention a year and if I um, get as many people in Toronto as I possibly can. And I very quickly went, well, it can't just be comics, it can't just be science fiction. It has to be popular culture mm -hmm. because that way I have a, a, a larger access. I can get Michael Dorn when he comes to a convention in Toronto. I can do all the conventions in Toronto. I can get all the local writers. Uh, but that was tricky, too, because, you know, Charles DeLint was in Ottawa. Well, you have to wait for him to go on tour. Uh, you, you, the, Robert J. Sawyer had just had yeah. a novel coming. I mean, as it turned out, he had a novel a year for 20 Forever. years. Forever. There you go. So the so the show was this very, um, I had to craft it in such a way right from the beginning where we would pick a topic and then I could use as many people at all because I thought you, you can't show this writer, let's say, or artist, Ken Stacy 
for half an hour. It yeah. just isn't going to work. None of these people are used to TV. None of them are good on TV. And it's not going to work. But I can create pace and I can create energy and I can create a narrative arc like a stained glass window using all these various interviews. But what I the interesting thing was that as that the first year was terrible because we had a director who didn't get the topic and didn't like me and didn't like Rick and didn't find it funny and thought it was a bunch of nerds and. He'd said to me, which I thought was a lie, and then I've now decided was the most true thing that anybody has ever told me about television. (laughs) He said, you know the most valuable thing you have on your show? You have a half hour a week. And that was, he was right. But he didn't think I had anything else. And um, it was funny because one of the moments that really broke my heart was I had an interview with Terry Pratchett. And Mm. he came into the studio and we, I did the interview with Terry and all I had the, you know, I had the, the earpiece on and the director was saying, ask him about how much money he makes, ask him about how oh much God. money he makes. And I thought, that's not my show, but this, this is not about how much money anybody makes. And so afterwards he said, well, why didn't you ask the question? And I said, well, he's 4% of the market in Britain and he can't sell a book in the States. Yeah. So I'm not going to ask him a question that's embarrassing. And he, he was very taken aback by that. He went, really? Like, that's interesting. And I went, yeah, no, it's not. No, no. I'm going to get him to talk about narrative. I'm going to get him to talk about the work. And so that's what it became. But it was, you know, and then if we had someone like Nichelle Nichols, I could get Rick Green to yeah. interview them. But if it was somebody who I was passionate about, which was 90 eight percent of the interviewees uh i i would interview nick park i would interview will benton i would interview anybody whose work really caught my eye well let me sorry i was gonna say the other thing too is that again i said i had no genre i'm not i don't think that way but it also meant that i didn't really care if you had 20 books or if you had 10 short stories if i loved the work i wanted to talk to you and that's how we ended up interviewing Neil Gaiman when he was just starting out on his career. But I love the work. I want to, Isaac was five years old when this show was out. But I I just want to read to him the first guests that you had on episode one. That's what I was putting in the background here. Listen to this, Isaac. Interviews with Bob Kane, creator of Batman, Frank Miller, writer of RoboCop, Kevin Eastman, co-creator of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Max Allen Collins, Dick Tracy, Dave Stevens, artist of Rocketeer, Larry Niven, SF writer, George R. R. Martin, SF writer, Bill Sienkiewicz, comic book artist, Rick Geary, comic artist, Mike Kaluta, comic artist, Harlan Ellison, SF writer. Yeah. That's impossible. No, you can't. Yeah. I mean, this is I, the funny thing is about this is, like you say, I was pretty young when this came out, but I actually remember seeing it. I did. TVO was on a lot, lot in my home. I do remember that set. The set is unmistakable that you've got your host on. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I was actually going to go there. I love the, uh, the, the design of it. But the but yeah, I actually, no joke, want to go back through this and I have to watch it on YouTube, unfortunately, it, but. Listen, that first episode comes out and punches you in the face. And it's people that you're passionate about. But the other thing is, I'm not even, like, I'll cop to this right now. I I, I hadn't thought of this, and maybe Isaac's thinking about it. Can you imagine, Isaac, where I got a lot of my influence and how I interview people? Based on what he said so far? I think that you may have uh, picked up a few tricks, if you will. I mean, everything that Mark is saying about about how we approach this is echoing so many things in my mind yeah. of just how we approach filmmaking ourselves. I don't even want to, didn't want to go there to say, oh, wow, that sounds an awful lot like how we do docs, but I think it actually does sound well, an awful lot like how we do approach things. It's, Maybe it's just also being Canadian too. I don't know if that's a thing, but. It's not just. <laughs> it is a thing. It is a thing. It is definitely a thing. And, and I, first of all, Canadians are fascinated by American popular culture. Well, I shouldn't say, we're, we're interested in French, British, like anything that isn't Canadian, <laughs> we're interested yeah. in that. Well, and, uh, yes. But I think we're cute. I think I was asking questions that Bob Kane had never, Bob Kane at the end of that interview said, 
that is the best researched interview ever. You are the greatest interviewer I, that's ever interviewed me. Cool. And I had to laugh because his publicist came up to me and said, this is Bob Kane. Can you interview him now? And I had to bump. I think I bumped Bill Sienkiewicz for Bob Kane. And so Bill went off to the bar and I sat down with Bob Kane and interviewed him. And I was I had no questions written down, but I asked him all the really, you know, yeah. simple questions. But he I gave him enough rope that he hung himself. So well, that was fun. I think I think there's two things. I mean, one of the things I wanted to make mention of is that Rand used to say that all the time when we would be on the road, be like, just be nice Canadians yeah. and, and, and do that. And I think the most important thing in this is it could be linked to a cultural difference that makes us different, uh, is the fact that there's a listening component there, is that it sounds like Mark listened a lot. And that's the kind of, a, and retaining that information is, is a very important and unique element to what makes this work well. And that episode that I pulled out from season, uh, the second season, first episode, uh, first episode of season two, but was also an example of, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, you leaning into what you already knew and cared about so that there's, there's passion in it, but there's also this sense of you're, you don't have to study for something that you like. You're having a conversation with someone that you're genuinely interested in. That's true, but that would be, it would be disingenuous of me to just say I walked in. Like I, if I was going to interview Jane Yolen, I was going to read 20 books. If I was going to re interview, no, it's true. And I remember one of my favorite stories is I went to New York at the, to the Nebula Awards and we, the big person we were going to get was Isaac Asimov. Wow. And so, okay, that was going to go to Rick Green. He was going to interview him. And I, I fallen in love with a, a book called Phases of Gravity by Dan Simmons. And so I reached out to his publisher and I said, look, I'm going to be there and can I interview him? And then he was having lunch the day of the interview with uh, Richard Curtis, who was his agent, and Robert J. Sawyer, who was yeah. also repped by uh, Richard Curtis. And um, at the interview, Dan Simmons was having such a good time. He said, oh, I'm going to blow off that interview because TV people, they don't even read my books. And Sawyer said, well, who is it? And he go, oh, well, it's, you know, Mark Asquith. And he said, Mark will have read every yeah. one of your books. I guarantee it. So I'm doing the interview with, with uh, Dan and I, you know, it's very organic, but I'm, you know, following up certain themes because that's how the show works. Each show will have a theme. Mm -hmm. And, but he, I, he started, I, I would talk and then he would do this and then he would do, and I realized he's counting something on his hands. So is it when I go um or ah, or is it when I, do I have a nervous tick? I mean, what, what's he counting? And at the end of it, I, I said, look, I have to ask, because it was driving me crazy in the interview, because as you say, you're listening, but you're also listening with your eyes, your whole being. Yeah. You're, you're trying to get the energy of the person across from you. And this was very distracting. And he said, well, Rob Sawyer said you'd have read every book I'd written. And I was starting to count them <laughs> as you were going. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. What I don't understand is why aren't there like a mountain of books behind you in your room right now? Oh, my God. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> His it's just insane. I, 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 yeah, because I've been in the book industry for so long. Um, I have, I mean, I don't even want to know. Like, thousands and thousands and thousands of books. We have three different libraries in this house. My wife is also a literary editor, so we have her books. We have all the books that, or not all, but we have some of the books that my mom collected. And then we have almost every book I've had in my life because my parents wouldn't throw them out. And I only just recently got rid of, I would say 90% of my comics. Which... Because I just, it was being taken over. And I'm not gonna use them the same way that I was using them on my shows. Um, and, and now I don't have to. Like back in the day, if you wanted to talk about, you know, Fantastic Four number one, you probably had to have a copy of Fantastic Four number one to do the correct images. Yeah. So that's what I had. Uh, it was funny going through the boxes because I, they, I, I went through one box and I thought, well, this is strange because I got Sword of Sorcery and Star Wars and, and American Flag all mixed up together and then went, ah, no. This is the Howard Chaikin box, because when I would interview somebody, I would just go, well, I'm interviewing Mike Kaluta. Here's all the Mike Kaluta books. I'm interviewing uh, Len Wein. Here's all the Len Wein books. So 
that was how my collection, it, it's not really a collection, it's a bunch of comics, but th they were sorted really by how I was going to use them on television. I think it's fair to say that you had and probably still have a rather stunning collection. So Isaac, don't be afraid that he's not in front of his tower of collecting. No. I'm also going, we should shoot that collection someday. <laughs> I wish I wish that I'd had the truckload of money that could have bought it for this show. Now you do also yeah. have beautiful art. And one of the things that you've shared on Facebook, you have some very interesting personal stuff. You have something personal from Mobius, do you not? Uh, well, you know, I'm not sure I can do this, but let me try. There you go. So, so here's here it is. What I'm gonna do. I'm I'm just gonna wander over here. And <laughs> I don't know that you can see that. Oh wow. Yeah. Now just tip it down if you would, Mark. Tip the there you oh, go, there Isaac. Go. Yeah. Oh no way. Yeah, way. Oh man. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, Mobius spent 10 days in Toronto and uh, I spent, well, I was his minder. So I was with him most of the time. And so I've got all kinds of photographs of him and I kept trying to make things interesting for him. So I would call up artists and go, um, do you want to come down and have lunch with Mobius? So Ken yeah. Stacy got to meet him and Rick Taylor and a whole lot of people. And he did a signing at the store and I did a, um, uh, I used to tell a, story about Mobius coming into the store and doing a signing and it became famous and then mm -hmm. people started misquoting it and I was telling it to um, Mike Kaluta and he said you know what you need to turn this into a comic mm -hmm. and I said no I'm not going to do that because it's not going to work but I can type it up and put it on you know I can make it a story and then realized no one's going to publish you know <laughs> A thousand words on Mobius visiting the Silver Snail. So Rick Green said, "I'll turn it into a comic," and Rick Green did, and and it's it's a good, it's a really interesting, true story, and it was fun to do a documentary comic like this. Is if I'd had a camera, this is what would have happened. Now I'm on that. You can find it. Everyone should Google it. It's out there. You can find that story. But the comic is called Growing Up with Comics, and the story is called Mobius, a Sketch. And Isaac and people like him who love Mobius's work can't even probably imagine him as a person, right? Like he is a legend. And Metal Erlon aside, you can go back to the cowboy stuff. This guy had been so instrumental in influencing so many people. What was he like as a person? Was he gentil and everything we would imagine as a French stereotype? He, that's, a, I, I didn't really know what to expect because the work to me was three different people. So mm. there was the artist who did Blueberry. There was the mm -hmm. artist that felt like Robert Crumb to me and did a lot of that kind of stuff. And then there was the artist who I felt was a true spiritual investigator uh, and that work would be like the in cow so I didn't really know so I thought I'm not going to project anything on this guy I'm just going to mm. be as neutral as possible um, and then just wait and see what happens but and because of that I think I created a weird dynamic where he came to me like he he was very kind of drawn to me and I don't really know why um, but I, I will say that at one point, at the end of his time in, uh, in 1987, I, uh, I, I had to go back to Ottawa for personal reasons. And uh, I told Jean, I said, I have to go back because my father is dying. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry, I will always be your son. Which completely caught me by surprise. Wow. <laughs> Somebody is your mentor. And, but he saw me in this weird father role. But I, I, I kind of get it because I was his minder and I was taking care of him. And those qualities of a producer, I have naturally. And so I would just make sure that everything would work for him. I will tell you uh, one funny story about Mobius. He asked what he's like. We went out to dinner and uh, 
some of the guys from Marvel got pretty drunk. And so one of them said, you, you know what we call you in the office? No, good. What do, what do you call me in the office? We call you the mob. <laughs> and he looked at them and he said, ah, yes, I must tell my wife, Claudine, she is married to the mob. <laughs> <laughs> the so mob. that, you know, he was full of, and later in my life, when I met some holy people, I would say that that was the quality that they had, that Shaw had. They were very uh, centered and mm -hmm. very funny. And he was so funny. And uh, and because of that, I would be laughing constantly. And people would be kind of offended that I was laughing at Jean Giraud. But I'm like, I'm on his wavelength. This is hilarious. And uh, but yeah, it was. It, it's a strange thing it's a it it was weird it was weird I, I the other one was so with the last meal we had he was vegetarian and sometimes it was hard because he would only want to eat certain things and there was mm -hmm. one day where he wanted to eat raw you know food and vegetables of course and on the last day i said you know so what do you feel like i need to order the restaurant i need to figure this out and he goes i feel like a pork chop <laughs> So, I don't know. Oh boy. Really, for nine days, you're, you're, you're vegetarian. And on the last day, you've decided that it's going to be a pork chop. Anyway, these are little insights into so John. Strange. I couldn't uh, sum them up in a few minutes. But he constantly was... I will, okay, another story. Okay. So I set up that artists could meet him for half an hour. So he did the <laughs> signing. He did three signings for us. They were fantastic. But he, uh, I brought in four artists to talk to him. One of them was Rick Taylor. And Rick Taylor had a beautiful hardcover book. And at the end of uh, basically half an hour critique of Rick's work, he drew uh, Rick as a Star Watcher. And it's definitely oh, wow. Rick. And he's got all the Star Watcher garb. And it's just the greatest thing I've ever seen. So Jean said to me at dinner, you know, is there anything that you would like from me? And that's a daunting thing. And I said, well, I would love it if you would draw my portrait. And, um, but I had to go back to Ottawa. I went back, I came back, there was a manila envelope. And I, it, one of the things was the drawing that I showed you. The yeah. other one was a beautiful a drawing of my wife as a star watcher, which is beautiful. Amazing. And then there was the portrait he did for me which is on Facebook, but I look like a little Nemo on a cloud and I'm pointing at a bird and I, I look like a child. And I was so offended. I'm like, what the hell? I want to be a star watcher. I, he knows that. He knows that I want to be that. But that's what I mean. He's very confounding. I think yeah. he knew this was a really funny thing to him. Like I, And it took me a while. I'm not kidding. It took me several years and I showed it again, to my one of my mentors, Mike Kaluta, and I showed it to Kaluta and Charles Vess, and they both looked at it, and they went, oh, my God, he's like, he sees your soul. Like, that's who you yeah. are. I'm like, Lars, I yeah. want to be a star watcher. <laughs> you're like, no, you're you're not a star watcher. Sorry. You're that really yeah. excited, uh, you know, you, you're that child from, um, you know, uh, Le Petit Prince, or, or the child from Little Emo. You, you are full of awe and wonder. And I thought, okay, that's a compliment. Oh, it's a okay. huge compliment. Oh my God, that's amazing. So oh. let's, I, I don't want to keep you here all night and I do want to bother yeah, you about the next. 10, but yes, we, we can do it. Um, you moved over to do two things that are interesting. One, I was obsessed with the show, The Prisoner and you put it into comics, and then you sort of set up the Prisoner of Gravity writ large at space. Could you talk to both of those quickly before you have to go? Yeah, I'll talk about, about, talk about the Prisoner first. So I had been uh, writing a spy uh, graphic novel called The Silencers with Rick Taylor, and I really did a lot of research, and I, I was very intrigued by... Um, spies and spies and comics because I didn't want to do what anybody else was doing. And uh, Dean Motter was a friend and he went down to uh, New York and he talked to Richard Bruning and he pitched them 
And one of the things he pitched was my dream project. And because I said, if I could do anything in comics, it would be The Prisoner. I would love to do a sequel to The Prisoner. And Dean, I, you know, bless his heart, he pitched my dream project. Yes. And they said, well, we can't get the rights because it's complicated. And and they tried. And But it took a year, about a year and a half, and they did get the rights. So then we got to do the project. And, and that was very, very exciting. And so Dean and I co-plotted it. And then I wrote all the dialogue, except for maybe the last three or four pages, wow. because by the time that was happening, I was already moved on to other projects. But, um, yeah, The Prisoner was one of, I mean, that that was a dream project. I, I, I can't believe it, you know, uh, to work on something that mattered so much to me. And I would watch the show with my dad, and my dad would ask me questions. And I remember that final episode, crazy. Fallout, and my dad would say to me, well, what do you think happened? And try to, and what is that song, you know, and trying to figure figure out what happened and then why that show had such an impact on me. And I don't know, like I, it's hard for me to, as Alan Moore would say, it's hard to look under the hood for some people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to be an automotive mechanic. And most of my job is asking people about that machine, that creative machine. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't know how mine works. I just know that I was obsessed by that show. Um, and it was great to be able to do that. I, I, Obviously, now I'm older, I would do it in a different way. But at the time, that was great. Uh, space, well, that was that was interesting. I, uh, I had a job. I had two jobs. And uh, I was very happy. And anyway, as it turned out, they had hired a producer called Dennis McGrath. There only was going to be one producer. But... The people that were being interviewed for the creative director position kept mentioning me like it was a big deal. And so Marcy Martin said, well, ah. you should come in because everybody, you, you're a big deal. People keep referencing you. So I came in and we had a chat and she asked me about what I thought space should be. And at the end of it, she said, well, I have no money and I have no title and, you know, but we'll work it out. We'll, we'll make this work. And I thought, well, I don't know this is going to work. And, uh, it did. I, we, we, you know, it, it was fantastic. It was a lot of work. Uh, it was in many ways, it was less work than prisoners of gravity and all that mm. reading. Cause I, you know, that was the core of Pac, but it was complicated in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, you know, I had control of, you know, a control of that's the wrong word, but I was really doing the content on Pog. And it was very focused and right. you did half an hour a week where space was just this machine that just ate material. It just wanted as much material as you could make. And so we did space news, which was a three minute segment every day. And then I would have to do two or three other segments that we called flow that Moses and I were called flow. So I was really working hard, um, probably producing three or four pieces a day. Oh. So, that's that's 20 pieces a week. That's a lot of pieces. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah, it's too much. But and, we needed to launch the channel and we needed and I was I really felt strongly that the material that we would put would resonate with people so they would because honestly that first year was nothing but reruns. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, X-Files reruns, we had Star Trek reruns. Like how are you going to get how are you going to send a signal to people that intelligent life is actually at <laughs> space. How do you say, we know, yeah. you know, we know what you want. And so yeah. I would make these things that would be, um, you know, hopefully thought provoking or just weird or have somebody that the certain part of the audience would think is a big deal, like an interview with Jillian Anderson or Chris Carter mm -hmm. or David Duchovny talking about a show. I mean, yes, it was promotion, but at the same time, it was promotion that was kind of targeted to fans. And I knew from Prisoners of Gravity that if you got all the details right, if you got the right clip, you know, you did the right thing, people would freak out. And one of my favorite pieces <clears throat> was just the moments where Gillian Anders said, where are you going, Mulder? And she did that in seven or eight different episodes. And I just strung them all together. And But that sent a signal to fans, like these guys 
care about these shows, which was what I felt my job was because the, you know, science fiction fans hate giant corporations. They hate that kind of branding. They Mm -hmm. want it to speak to them and they have a very specific idea of what a a channel like that should be. And, uh, and boy, it was a tough sled because they hated everything. Um, but obviously they didn't, but they were passionate, uh, you know, and the fan, you know, working with the fans and, and doing that was always, uh, amazing because they became at some point they become the content for you. Uh, the speaker's corner was happening on the corner and, and somebody would say, well, we want you to have Firefly. Like why can't, or no, it's Farscape, excuse me. Why can't you show fire, you know, this show? I said, well, I don't have the rights like that. Why TV own it? And they said, yeah, but why TV don't care about it? And you guys will. So some signal was getting out there. Mm-hmm. And so I said, OK, get dressed up in costume, go to Speaker's Corner and demand that we get Farscape <laughs> and then I'll put it on the air and then we'll see if programming will bite. And and it happened. So then the fans are really excited because then they think, oh, my God, we made this thing happen. Yeah. And they did. They made Buffy happen on space. They made a number of shows yeah. that were, you know, maybe we'll get, maybe we won't. But suddenly you have fans telling you what they want. And they're so unvarnished, too. They're so rude about what it is they want to tell you most of the time. Oh, but, yeah? You know, really? They, but it's passion. <laughs> and so, you know, they don't realize that they're being uh, rude yeah. about it. But I And I never took it that way. I just said, yeah. you know, if they came up to me and said, you bleepity, bleepity, bleepity need to be running this show, mm-hmm. I would just think, okay, they want me to run that show. <laughs> Well, we always cut somebody's favorite thing from a movie before it gets on any kind of platform, right? W- whatever it is, the the best thing's always on the cutting room floor. S- somebody's. That's just the nature of the beast. Well, listen, Mark Asquith, I know you need to go. Uh, before we let you escape, can you tell us, since you're a tastemaker with such a, I would say, legendary history? What is it that you're looking at now? I mean, those of us who are past a certain age, I think people imagine that we just go back and read, you know, Hulk 181 over and over again and remember when Wolverine was a baby. But there's got to be something else that's yeah, we floating. Yeah, sit around and we read Hulk 181 all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair. That's not fair. Did you guys set that up? You guys set that up. Well, he's going to talk a little bit about Wolverine. I was going to, but that was, yeah, I, he didn't set that up. It was just, I happened to have a bunch of comics about that had Wolverine in them. And I didn't know <laughs> Randall was going to do that. But um, I, you know, I kind of have a rule. I listen to people. And then if three people tell me that I should be watching something mm-hmm. or reading something, then I tend to uh, have my antenna go up. Mm-hmm. So right now, it's, it hasn't come out yet. Susanna Clark's uh, book, new book called Pyrenese. I'm waiting for that. I just finished reading um, Reisman's book about the rise and fall of Stan Lee. I got Ooh. an advance uh, copy of that. And that's extraordinary. I, can't, I have to give it my absolute you know, five-star blue chip uh, you know, recommendation. It's, it's a remarkable book. And he's already being slammed on social media because everybody assumes that he's either going to love Stan or hate Stan. And they're trying to figure out, is he a lover or a hater? And he's a journalist. It's, it's fantastic. There were parts of Stan's story that I, I didn't know. There were things I knew and didn't think anybody else knew, and they're in the book. And uh, so that's a big recommendation. Yeah. As far as comics go, I'm, I'm, I'm a late convert to Sergio Tapi. And those volumes are coming out. And so the third or fourth one is about to come out. I'm a big, big fan of what Scott Dumbier is doing at IDW. And then there's, he's got two of those beautiful art books coming out. One of them is Jim Lee. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to buy that. But I am definitely buying the Michael Golden Micronauts book, which is, I've seen a few pages and it just looks amazing. Then new stuff, you know, there's... You know, I don't buy floppies anymore because yeah. the graphic novels are the way to go. Mm-hmm. And the story is complete because nobody seems to write comics the way they did in the 60s and 70s no. where you get done in one kind of stuff. 
but I've been reading Tom King's work and uh, mm-hmm. he's been doing some very great stuff. Miracle man, sorry, miracle man. You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Mr. Miracle. Um, Mr. Miracle. <laughs> um, but that, that was, was a nice throwback miracle man. Yeah. Well, we can, we could do a whole hour on miracle man too. We could. I feel like there's a few things we can do a whole hour with. Uh, I didn't even get to ask him if and when he met Joe Jodorowsky. <laughs> in the middle of all that. How did you know I met Jodorowsky? I didn't. Because you met everybody. I just assumed you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Joda and I really didn't get along. That was really funny. I did a tandem interview. I, I interviewed him first, and then uh, Daniel Richler interviewed him after me. And I was, uh, I, I tried to focus it on his spirituality because I had an interview with Jean that I wanted to cut it in with. And I thought and I kept kind of pushing him. And this is a guy who does not no. like to be pushed. Even when I was asking him questions like, tell me how your collaboration with Jean Giraud works. How, how do you guys do it? And he would, go, he would go, I am not talking, that is sacred. I am not going to talk about that. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was a terrible interview and I was practically in tears. And then wow. I left the room and Daniel did his interview. And then they called me up the next week and I watched my interview and I went, no, it's not as bad as I thought. And I can salvage this. And they called me up and I, I well, I, no, I, yeah, they called me up and they said, could we use parts of your interview? And I said, yeah, but as long as I get to use some of yours, because Daniel obviously had a huge connection with Jodo and they really hit it off and it's going to be great. And so we kind of swapped tapes and I watched their tape and went, it's unusable. There isn't a single thing that can be used on television. So no wonder they want my tape. Yeah. And uh, so they used my tape and kind of cut me out and put Daniel in. And, uh, and that was fine. Um, but, and, and as, as you guys know, when you're interviewing somebody, when you're in the room and that antagonism happens mm-hmm. and they're arguing with you, you feel that it's bad. But when you're in the edit room, you go, that's great. He's really, we're seeing it, the fire in yeah. his eyes. I do it and all the time. I constantly yeah. have to remind myself of that. Yeah. I, I do a thing where I'm wrong on purpose. Like, how could I be so stupid? And I've had people say to me, you're so dumb. You don't know this. And then they explain something. And I just sit there, really? Oh, wow. Thanks, Neil. I did that on stage once. And I was, somebody was, I had to do a thing. And I thought, Okay, I can either get this right or I can get this wrong. And if I get it wrong, his answer will be better Mm -hmm. than if I get it right. And so I deliberately got it wrong. And afterwards, he said to me, like, you, it was kind of set up. Like, I know you knew that answer. And I went, yes, but it's not about me getting the right answer. Mm -hmm. It's about you having to explain it. And this was a revelation. He was like, you did that. Like, you made yourself look bad. In like in front of eight hundred people, I'm like, I didn't, I didn't feel I made myself yeah. look bad. I got a great answer out of you. <laughs> I did get to look like a bit of a clown, which is fine. Yeah. When I interviewed Stan Lee the last time I interviewed Stan Lee, I said to him before we went on stage, "Look, these people know who I am, and they know I'm a little bit too intellectual. They know I'm really kind of going to go after the deep questions. So make fun of me, like yeah. make fun of me at every tour turn." Because they will think this is hilarious. And Stan, again, he looked at me. He's like, really? You want me to make fun of you? I'm like, it would be my honor. <laughs> Truly. Did you meet Stan um, or uh, interview Stan in his last trip through Toronto by any chance? Yes, I did. Was yeah. he well I, enough I, to I do that? I interviewed him the first time for, uh, I didn't interview him for Come Up But Confidential. And that was a hurtful thing to me. I mean, it wasn't anybody's fault, but I wanted to do it and I couldn't do it. And then I interviewed him for Prisoners of Gravity and then for Space about a dozen times. But I only got him once for Pog. And I wish I'd gotten him more because he's so, A, he's so recognizable. And Mm -hmm. B, he's so concise and he's so flamboyant. And a lot of people in comics are not that way. I mean, obviously, famously, he becomes, you know, Barnum and Bailey of comics. I mean, he the P.P. Barnum, he, he could sell it where as very few people could. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and then I, yeah, I, I, he was so generous with me and I would get emails from Stan Lee and I just, my mind would just explode every time I got one. Yeah. It's a legend, isn't it? Really come yeah, to life. It's yeah. weird. And 
you know, just meeting Jack Kirby, just meeting some of these people. And and in retrospect, that Jack Kirby show that we did on Prisoners of Gravity, more people have seen that than almost anything else I've done. Maybe the Watchmen show. But the, there are no other really, really good interviews no. with Jack Kirby there are, because people, um, even Gary Groff in the Comics Journal, went after things that Jack had forgotten. And I didn't do that. I, mm-hmm. I realized I was dealing with someone who didn't have total recall and, and had poor recall. And so I went after the heart of Jack Kirby, yeah. which ended up working out really, really well. Um, and then I got all intellectual on The Watchmen. Well, that's the place to do it, right? Well, but listen. My life is, I mean, my career has just been, I, I think it's because people recognize passion and, and that's why they, at some point in the interview or at some point after the interview, they go, interview me anytime, call me anytime. And, yeah. and you think, this is nuts. Because I can't be, I used to think it was disingenuous. I used to think that people were, just saying that to butter me up or something. And I, I didn't get it. And um, it wasn't really until I was <laughs> another crazy story, but having a beer with Terry Pratchett and Terry wow. Pratchett said, Oh no, I do book tours. I go all over Britain, all over North America. And you're one of the few people who reads the books. And then I would interview Mike Magnola. And I, I remember joking with him once. And I, I said, so what's the new arc of Hellboy about? And he says, Oh, I, I won't know that until you interview me. <laughs> so it's I, I think maybe you you said this but I think there is a, a, a weird thing that happens in terms of you got a biofeedback going with certain creators and and you put something out there and then they respond to it uh, and sometimes their work will change because you'll well uh, with Frank Miller I remember saying what do you mean you've never seen the work of Joe Cooper and then I gave him you know the full stack of enemy ace and you can see in the first half wow. of the Punisher story, it looks like old Frank Miller. And the next issue is he's read Joe Kubert. You can tell. You can look at the eyebrows. You can go, that guy studied Joe Kubert. And it's in one issue. It's a, it's a wild, well, That's go back crazy. and check it out if you don't believe me. But it's a weird thing. So, yeah, I think it's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If I'm in the, in the room, things will happen that will only happen if I'm the one doing it, which is the same, I know is true with you, Randall, when you'll be in a situation and something will happen and often it'll be a random thing. And somebody will go, why did you mention the color blue? As it turns out, blue is the most important, you know, color in my life. And you'll think, okay, I don't know where that came from, but okay. I don't know why you said that, but over there, our editor is nodding. I think part of it is that maybe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's that it becomes about them. It's about the work. And if you're doing it right, you recede and they come to fill the space. If you pull back yeah. properly, you give them just enough and they do all the work, like as should happen. You know, that's where our job is to allow them to be the best version of themselves and give them the context. I think, I think that you nailed it. I think you're, that's 100%. And, uh, and magic can happen because sometimes they are responding to that void that in a new way that they haven't responded to before. Yeah. Well, listen, I know you're on a timeline here. It's 9.51. We'll let you roll out of here. I really appreciate you making the time, and I'd love to do it again sometime. If we talk about Sandman and Neil Gaiman, would you do it? Sure. Any, any, anything you I'm want to sure. talk about. I'm pretty sure you can um, talk about everything. <laughs> well, because of my period, which I, I, as, as, as a somebody in the industry from 1982 to, I always think of it ending at the beginning of space, which is 97, but that's not really true because I go to San Diego until the, you know, into the 2000s. Um, but yeah, that was a, a really important period. And, mm-hmm. and even one year, like 1986 I know. at the Silver Snail was probably the greatest year in comic book history. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, fantastic work coming out from George Perez, John Byrne, Frank Miller, Art Spiegelman, Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons, uh, you know, Paul Chadwick. You know, even the, the minor names like Paul Chadwick in that context are 
brilliant, brilliant cartoonist. And uh, yeah, I, that 19, yeah, that 1986 was insane, insane. And, and that was one of the years that we had, had jaw up and um, yeah, it's a weird thing. So it's, a, it's mm-hmm. you know, and as I said earlier in this interview, when I got into comics, particularly when I started working at the, the Silver Snail, the, the attitude was, it's done. This is all nostalgia. I know. You know this is a nostalgia store. Uh, this is not about what's new and current. Um, you know, most of the focus was on back issues and getting the back issues. Uh, but when I came in, I... I kept the back issues. I didn't disturb them. I kept the, you know, them selling, but I focused on the new stuff. And, and that was where it was the right guy at the right time. You know, you had stuff that needed to be explained. You've got to explain Bill Sienkiewicz to the man Mm -hmm. on the street or the woman on the street. If a woman came into the store, which was in 1982 was very rare. You'd show them love and rockets. You'd show them that kind of stuff. By the time I was out of the snail, uh, four or five years later, uh, working on Prisoners of Gravity, if I walked into the Silver Snail, I saw women there, and they were there because of Love and Rockets and Sandman. Mm-hmm. You know, Sandman, you know, is a sea change in comics. Mm-hmm. Hey, but you can't get ahead of that. That's another day. <laughs> and I'll forget it. You'll go, tell me about what you said about Sandman. I'm going, I don't know. Well, you know, I... Something I Sandman. We won't put this in the in the episode, but I actually just had to go and rebuy Sandman one, two, three, four, five. I think I oh, no. I, I got rid of them long ago. Yeah, stupidly. Do you need the later ones? I've got a whole lot of doubles of, of some of the later ones. I'd have to go back and check. I, I, um, as I told you, any comics that you're thinking of selling, let me know. I'm very interested, yeah. and we always have a churn here for this show. A churn, good word. I'm yeah, always no, it's, looking. It's, the, in in getting rid of the comics, I got rid of most of the expensive ones, and mm-hmm. I only kept the ones of that were done by my friends. Mm-hmm. So I kept, you know, I mean, it's still a pretty good collection, but I bet. it's very uh, curated by um, these are people that I know um, and uh, or have met, and you know, it is it is a weird thing. But the comics essentially are now there because they're sentimental but i i I tried to throw out not throw out i tried to get rid of the sandman and i couldn't do it even though i have all the different versions i've got all the graphic novels going back to those issues yeah still there's something in it there's some charge there's some electricity to going back to an original issue and i don't know why that is and I sometimes think, is it the smell of rotting paper? Is it the <laughs> fact that, the, you know, this is the issue that I read the day it came out? Uh, I don't know. I can't. It's a very it's a very mysterious thing, your relationship with a comic book like that um, yeah. in that way. Uh, even, you know, graphic novels that are produced as graphic novels where 200 pages will drop. I will keep all of those because I, I, they, they can't be replaced. Uh, mm-hmm. I had a very good friend called Tom Stormoth who sold his comics when he went down to the States to work at Diamond. And he said, uh, I said, I'm going to get rid of my comics. And he said, whatever you do, don't. I said, why? Well, you're, you're at Diamond. You can pick up any comic yeah. that you want. I mean, I'm in Toronto. If I want Sandman 50, I can get Sandman 50. It's not going to be a problem. But I might as well, you know, purge right now. And he said, yeah, but it won't be the one you read. Wow. That weird thing. But, you know, to still have the comics that I collected and read when I was a teenager Mm -hmm. matters to me. I still have those Tantan. They're really super beat up. Oh, really? Um, You know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, And and the other weird thing, this is an aside. But so I've known Neil all these years and I was talking to him recently and I said, you know what? You've never, that's not actually true. He said, you've never signed a Sandman comic for me. And he goes, oh, I'm sure I had it. I said, yes, you signed one for Elizabeth Holden, uh, the the one that Colleen Duran drew. uh, um, But other than that, you've never signed a Sandman. And he goes, oh, you probably have the only unsigned Sandman one in existence. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I have one now. Oh, you own one. 
I have an unsigned Sandman now. Oh, fantastic. Because I had to go out and, no, unsigned. I had to go out and find it again. Oh, no. So what do you collect? Well, I am one of those guys who collected things that you suggested I collect, got rid of a collection, and right now I'm just picking up different things here and there that I was a Sienkiewicz guy, so I have a lot of that. I was a Wolverine guy from very early on and an X-Men guy early on. But the stuff that I like and the stuff that I had were often two different things, you know? Mm-hmm. I liked, mm. like, I liked the Nom. I liked Michael Golden's work there, so I read the Nom, and and I read, I read stuff that then later people would say, "Why did you collect that?" You know, like I'm that guy. I liked Excalibur at the time because I thought, "Oh wow, it's in England." You know, I was that guy. Alan Davis, nothing wrong with Excalibur. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I liked. Art I think that's Adams part of it and, too, is because I wasn't a genre guy. The moment. You know, Alan Moore took over Swamp Thing. Well, even before that, because I read Warrior magazine and I was mm. reading um, Marvel Man and I was reading V for Vendetta. And I couldn't sell those Warrior magazines to I save know. my life. I Nobody know. would buy them because they were black and white. It was a magazine. It wasn't perceived as being collectible. Mm-hmm. And I'm reading these stories going, I mean, are you kidding me? This guy's the best writer in comics. Mm-hmm. But nobody, you know, Claremont was the flavor of the month. I know. Claremont is great, and I love Claremont. I'm not going to take anything away from Chris Claremont. He, he built an empire, but Alan was doing something different. Totally when different. Alan took over Swap Thing, it was not immediately recognized because he was working in the wrong genre for mainstream buyers. He was yeah. working in horror. And that made no sense to me because I thought Stephen King and Clyde Barker, they sell by the bushel. So why doesn't horror sell in comics? Yeah, well, from from hell, for superior. example, is I think too dense and creepy for people. Hmm? From hell, for example, is too dense and too creepy and hard for a yeah. lot of people. They don't have context to bring into that story. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, again, that was published first in Taboo as part of an anthology. So I, I think it was a way like a soft launch, like people didn't really get it. And I honestly yeah. don't believe people got from hell until the whole book was there and they, yeah. they could read it and then realize that this was music and that Alan totally. was doing something in, well, with Eddie Campbell, something quite extraordinary. Totally. Same thing with Watchmen mm-hmm. and with Mouse. It, oh. When I read Mouse, when it came out in, in Raw, I read every issue, of, you know, the little insert, and it was okay. It was fine. When I read Watchmen, I loved Watchmen. Mm-hmm. But I did that thing. When they came out in graphic novel, I said, I'm going to read both of them from beginning to end as a collected edition yeah. because I was curious to see whether or not my response would be different. And it was Totally different. Mouse is Mouse devastating. went from being a book I liked to being one of the best graphic novels I've ever read. Yeah. Because when it was all together, you could see the mecha, you could see what he'd done. The same thing with Watchmen. The, you know, the individual issues are great for maybe the greatest comic book ever. My, I think it's my favorite comic ever. My favorite graphic novel is V for Vendetta, but my favorite mm. issue is Watchmen 4. But Watchmen, when you read that whole thing I from know. beginning to end and you feel the rhythm of it, it's it's an astonishing achievement. No wonder Time Magazine put it on its list of top 100 yeah. novels. Not even graphic novels, just novels. I, I think for me, Mouse is at the top of the pile as a graphic novel. As it, It's devastating, like so devastating. Have either of you read uh, uh, Lorenzo Matati's Fires? Okay, that's that's in my top five. Um, v is one. Um, yeah, I, I have trouble. You know, there's so many. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of Bone. See, I'm wearing my Bone. Yeah, I noticed, yes. Bone. Yeah, you know what? I, I was so simple. I, w- I got into comics through books in a way. Like I wanted the Conans. And I had the Lancers before I got into Conan comics. So I was seeking, you know, things that were connected to the books I was reading. 
Well, there, Lorenzo Matati. I got to go find that. Well, let's let him go. It's 10 o'clock. He's going to miss something or be in trouble. So let's do a proper yeah, ending. We, we could do this, you know, whenever you guys feel yeah. like it. But I, we could do a good, you want to do a proper goodbye? We'll just do a clean yeah. goodbye. We'll do a clean goodbye. Okay, here we go. Give me a wonder. This is one of those things that you could do all night. By the way, Isaac and I could not say anything. We could take our mics off and Mark Asquith could give you everything you need and more about comics because he's been there. He knows where the bodies are buried. He knows who everybody is and why you should read them. Isaac, what do you think? I think uh, you're right. I mean, even more so myself, I could be very quiet um, because uh, <laughs> I realized that it's like, you know, Randall is kind of like following in uh, Mark's footsteps a little bit, I think, in some of these... I think I've learned a little bit this evening about where your tastes and your... Uh, maybe the way you approach things that come from, and that's that's pretty rad. I actually feel pretty honored to to be privy to this. Well, thank wow. you, Isaac, and thank you, Randall, and it was a pleasure, and yeah, it's hard to condense, uh, all, you know, decades of reading comics into... <laughs> an hour but oh know, well there's try. lots more chats to have i think yeah we'll talk to you again again mark asquith i know you're doing something that maybe you can talk about later D did it go well the thing that you were working on don't say anything this is the point that i'm gonna make here we're all no matter how long we've been in it we want to stay in it we want to keep in it we want to put our fingers back in the water and get the mud all sprayed up i know you're still doing it don't stop Isaac, you're gonna have to go back and find Prisoners of Gravity. I, I've got like five windows open my inner on my computer right now. I was just going, oh, he said something else. Oh, he said yeah. something else. Yeah. So I have to start singing Journey on the way out because don't stop believing. Right, so guys? we're gonna talk about your past. We're gonna look into the future, and we're gonna thank you for coming out. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Isaac. Thanks, Randall.